Welcome to this episode of Kennedy Saves the World. Uh, I am very interested in talking to someone who is trying very diligently to save the world by reaching out to other very concerned environmentalists. And necessity is the mother of invention. And this person needed an outlet for his conservative environmentalism. There wasn't one when he was in college in Seattle. So he created the American Conservation Coalition. Benji Backer joins me once again. Hi, Benji. We're back. We're back with Backer. In person. And you have a wonderful new book, The Conservative Environmentalist. There are a lot of people who think that that is a contradiction in terms, but it's not. And you lay out a wonderful case how you became an environmentalist, just basically where you grew up. Mm -hmm. And then moving to the Pacific Northwest and yeah. beholding one of the most beautiful parts of the world, mm -hmm. not just the country. And, you know, that, that longing in you to conserve this, mm -hmm. not just preserve it, as you point out, there is yeah. a difference. Huge difference. Um, it has culminated in uh, this great piece of literature. Well done. Thank you. Well, it, it's, it's, it was an honor to write it. And, you know, I grew up loving the environment, but also being a conservative mm -hmm. and, when I told people that, they were like, oh, that's not possible. Like, when I told my peers that, they're like, oh, that's not possible. You must deny climate change. You must think that the environment isn't important. And we were, I was kind of in politics at a young age when it was Trump-Clinton, Trump-Biden, mm -hmm. and that kind of dichotomy couldn't be more obvious in that on, the, on those debate stages. So there was this partisan divide, and I was assumed to be a environmental hater because I was conservative, so I was like, something has to be done about that. Yes. And... I started this organization, but I also got to see the world from this divide that I think has made this issue impossible to solve, which is this urban-rural divide. I you know, grew up in, an, in a rural place, then I went to college in an urban place in Seattle, and I saw how this issue got so divided in the first place, which is that we've had urban elites telling rural people who power their lives what to do. So the people who are miners, the people who you know power our lives through fossil fuels, the farmers and ranchers they're being told what to do by people thousands of miles away that don't understand i mean they situation. really are snobs and, are. and that's the the point that you make because you grew up around nice mm -hmm. hard-working midwesterners right you grew up around farmers right who have to power their equipment with something right turns out that something isn't necessarily electric tractors yep and you move to seattle and there are a lot of people like well i'm an environmentalist right. like i'm john Kerry. Mm -hmm. but you know you point out something very important which happens in washington and oregon and california the people in the big cities look down their yes, noses do. at people in the rest of the state who do all the work and who provide mm -hmm. so much food and so right. many resources for all these snobs so they can pretend that they are better because they're elitists. That's exactly right. And, and the farmers and the ranchers and, and the people who power our lives, they love the environment. They want to stake in the environmental conversation, but they don't want policies that hurt them. And so we've had this belief as Americans now that environmentalism has to mean big government, that environmentalism has to mean this alarmism and throwing stupid paintings and, and blocking traffic for innocent people just trying to get to work. But that's not what environmentalism is about. It's about preserving, conserving, protecting the environment that we all share. And by the way, that the people who live closest to the environment can take care of it the best and that we shouldn't be shoving policies down people's throats but actually equipping them with the resources to do what they need to do and finding policies that actually work for people's pocketbooks and boost their livelihoods instead of take them away so tell me about and and i found this to be very interesting and you know it was something that i hadn't necessarily thought about um until i read it in your book and that is you know there are a lot of places that would love environmental local solutions mm -hmm. There are a lot of states that would love to build smaller, more efficient, safer nuclear reactors, mm -hmm. but they can't. They can't do these local projects because of the federal bureaucracy mm -hmm. and all of the rules and all of the regulations and all of the force that comes from the top down, from the federal government. Right. I mean, that's that's got to be really frustrating for you. Right. Hearing their stories. Yes. And trying to bring these projects 
to life. Yeah, I mean, I've traveled to hundreds of American communities and a lot, of, most of them rural, and they have so much opportunity to lead in the front of this. I mean, I, I just toured a uranium mine in Utah, the only one left in the United States. By the way, we're getting all of our uranium for nuclear fuel from Russia and other countries now because we've shut down all of our mines here in the United States. This is the last one remaining. That area, the, the uranium mine is the only economic driver in that area. And We've shut down all those mines across the United States. We've shut down all these communities' economic drivers when we could be using them to power a cleaner future. And so the government is not only stopping projects from happening from a red tape bureaucracy perspective, but it's also just stopping projects from happening from a shutting everything down in the United States perspective. I mean, we're blocking the ability to do what we need to do from an environmental standpoint, shipping that demand and supply overseas and making it to our adversaries to our adversaries who do not care about the environment whatsoever and we're pretending that we're doing the right thing here at home and I, and I talk about in the book a lot how California is the example of what you shouldn't do if you care about the environment and so Governor Newsom might claim that he's the pro-climate, pro-environmental governor, but they're one of the only states where emissions are increasing. They're one of the only states where energy costs are skyrocketing. Uh, believe it's me, I, I pay – like I cannot believe – how much my gas bill is. Mm -hmm. It's five times higher than right. when I moved into my house in California. And, you know, I don't have anything more to show for it. Right. Um, your emissions are probably going up. Yes. The, the, in, in your house. Uh, but the strain on the grid system mm -hmm. and the inability to modernize it because of the cost and the regulations. Right. But then they do a, a couple of vanity projects and they claim that they're making a big difference. But if you look at the macro picture, mm -hmm. it's getting much worse. It's getting way worse. And, and so that's why I have this belief. It's a crazy belief. But I believe that we need to build a brand new environmental movement. Yes. An environmental movement around the realities of the situation. That we need fossil fuels. That we need nuclear. That we need renewables. That we need every energy source as yes. part of the equation. And geothermal. Geothermal. You, know, you talk about part. geothermal in the book, which... A lot of people don't know how that works. So, you know, people are familiar with how nuclear reactors work mm -hmm. because of their high school physics classes. But explain geothermal for people who don't even know that that's an option. Well, the easiest th th way to talk about geothermal is think about Yellowstone mm -hmm. and how there are geysers. There's energy there. And <laughs> those geysers, that sort of energy is tapped underground in so many parts of the United States yeah. and so many parts of the world. And you can tap into it with the same process that you can when you're drilling for oil. And you can use the same infrastructure that you would use to drill for oil. But you're, you're harnessing the power of energy underground like fossil fuels are, but it's a renewable resource. And what's really cool about the geothermal process is that because you're using the same infrastructure and and materials as you would for drilling for oil, it's a one-for-one -one job opportunity mm -hmm. for the fossil fuel community. A, a solar panel or a wind turbine actually loses jobs for Americans because you once you set up the solar panel and wind turbine, there's really nothing to do. Yes, which was also <laughs> a very condescending thing to say. Right. When, you know, you're telling these coal miners exactly. who've been employed for decades, well, just... Just work in the solar industry. Yeah, well, those jobs don't exist. Build those panels. Right. And it's like, okay, so you build the panels, they're up, and then what? Right. With geothermal, that's not the case. Yes. So you're using the exact same thing, same exact so the, process. The tube goes down, the heat comes up the yep. tube, the tube spins a wheel. Yeah. The wheel powers the stuff. Exactly. It sounds like a great plan. And it's very similar. It's a very similar process, honestly, to hydropower, to nuclear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's using a lot of the same – it's not some revolutionary new idea. And I think that that's – like we're, people think, oh, we have sun, we have wind, we might as well just use what we have. And it's like, it's not as simple as that. We have to have 24 seven reliable fuel and we have to have 24 seven reliable energy. Geothermal provides that, hydropower provides that, natural gas provides that, and nuclear provides that. Those are the options that we have and they're all very clean mm -hmm. and they're all very sustainable and they all provide jobs for local communities. And America needs that right now. They also need innovation mm -hmm. because you need those processes to be streamlined. You need them to be smaller and accessible mm -hmm. and you only get that through innovation. Right. And innovation only works when there is incentive. Exactly. And, and the government telling like people what to do. To, to eat your vegetables. Yeah, you know. It's very I, transactional. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. More Kennedy saves the world right after this. In the book, I write about how I didn't eat vegetables. And I really, I had my first salad in college, by the way. Whoa. Yeah. 
but I've eaten a lot of salads since. I've been making up lost Were time. Were you corn fed? Uh, so my whole family are, so they're conservative vegans from Wisconsin. Stop it right now. Okay? Yes. It makes no sense. Okay. It, it's like being a, it's, it's a like. very it's like, gassy family reunion like... <laughs> if you guys are fueled by lentils. I'm not, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like Greta driving a Hummer back in 2005, okay? It's yeah. v- it doesn't make any sense. Because of that, I think I might have just gone to the opposite side and said, I'm only eating meat. Okay. Uh, so my parents really were trying hard to get me to eat some vegetables. And th- so they started to pay me 25 cents when I ate carrots. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, was the only way to get me to eat them. And forcing that down my throat to say, you have to eat these carrots or we're going to punish you, would just make me want to throw a tantrum and I'd be sent up to my room. Mm -hmm. But when I had the opportunity to benefit from eating the carrot, I actually wanted to. And you can see that on environmental issues. When government tells people what to do, then they throw people throw a tantrum and don't want to do it, and they go they run the other way. Don't mind me. <laughs> She's just dying over there. It's the plague. It's really fun. But it's when you best. have some, when somebody feels like they're part of the process and they're mm-hmm. benefiting from part of the process, then they're willing to do it. Okay, but how how does that translate to a bunch of hysterical children mm. uh, stopping traffic, throwing tomato soup? on priceless works of art, Mm -hmm. gluing their hands to um, basketball courts. I just did that this morning. Nicely done. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. I mean, imagine if I did that, but I was like, lower taxes. (laughs) Let's lower the taxes now. I don't think it would work. Probably not. No, I mean, it makes me me want to huff gas. Right. It doesn't make me want to end fossil fuels now and all these irrational alarmist demands that they have so how could they use an incentive structure instead of yelling at us and lecturing us and telling us that we're naturally bad like we're implicitly awful Mm -hmm. people what could environmentalists do differently to incentivize people to actually modify their behavior in certain ways to make the world a better place and save the world well those hysterical people do not actually want to save the world no they want to that's a great point. Make a point for themselves, and they want to make they 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 want to be on TV. They want to have attention. That shouldn't be the face of the environmental movement, and that's again why I think we need to take this issue back. We need to build a new environmental movement that returns to the heritage of those before us, like Teddy Roosevelt and even people like Ronald Reagan and and Richard Nixon, who were environmental stewards, worked across the aisle, by the way, to to foster uh, the shared connection to nature, but they came up with common sense solutions. The people who are hysterical are not part of the solution. No, and they also, like you lay out in the book, and it's really smart, like this is how you get things done. Right. You have to have goals mm-hmm. that are that measurable, measurable <laughs> and, and there has to be a timeline. And then once those goals are achieved, you have to acknowledge mm-hmm. that you have made progress. Right. Because if you live in the land of hysteria, the thing that fuels you is hysteria. Right. So that goes away when mm-hmm. the problems start to be solved. Exactly. And there's no longer a need for your brand of alarmism. Right. This, you know, just gross emotionalism. Well, I think like 80% of Americans don't like that. Yes. And so... It's off-putting. I, it's, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. Exactly. You could be super liberal. And, and that's why there's a huge opportunity to take it back because if if such a small percentage of the population believes that that's the way forward, then why are they the face of it? And why have we allowed them to be the face of I it? I don't know why they're the face of it. I don't know why Rashida Tlaib is the face of our <laughs> uh, Middle Eastern foreign policy. I don't understand why these insane children are the ones who get to direct the conversation when there is no conversation. There's just shouting. There's just shouting. And that shouting gets people's attention, but that's that that's where it stops. You know, that there, there's no actual progress that can be made from, from that shouting. And so... The reality is environmental issues affect all of us in, mm-hmm. a, in a substantial way. We, it's not just about the environment. It's about our neighborhoods. It's about our communities. It's about our national security. It's about every part of American life. Mm-hmm. And if we're allowing the people who glue themselves to buildings or block traffic to control the narrative, then we all are losing. The entire country is losing. And our environment deserves better, too. Do you think that they should sick police dogs on people who block roads? I think they got to clear any climate activist that's doing that from whatever they're doing and, and get the, yeah. I think they'd be with, scared of dogs. Dogs, yeah. Yeah. I think they'd be scared if you, like, brought them a cup of oil. 
Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. say, hey, you can stay here if you drink yeah. this. You drink the oil. Yeah. You can stay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, or, or drink the glue. You can stay here if you promise never to use fossil fuels in anything ever again. Yes. Because, and that means no computers. Right. No cars, no buses, right. no planes. You cannot step foot in a skyscraper. Nope. And you can't go skiing. You can't chew gum. You can't do I anything, I think they really. should all go to Haiti. Yeah, see see what life's like when you don't have reliable energy. Mm-hmm. I mean, you that's 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 the scary part of why, uh, of allowing this group to control the narrative because we are moving closer to those sorts of policies because mm-hmm. that's all we hear and that's all politicians hear. It's either that or doing nothing. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to get that until you pr- propose an alternative. Germany saw that. California is seeing that. And we have so much proof that it doesn't work, and yet we keep going towards it because there hasn't been an alternative. And in the book, I try to outline the fact that we no one knows what the future of energy looks like in the, in the world, but we know that we want affordable, reliable, and clean energy. Yes. And until we have politicians that pursue that agenda, we get closer to the, the likes of Germany and California, and we also get closer to the likes of Haiti mm-hmm. because – we have people pushing either intentionally or un- unintentionally, and I think there is a lot of ignorance and unintentional you know, malice, pushing for th- unreliable energy. Yes. And we can't afford that as a country. We can't afford that as people. And you know who that hurts the most are the lower income people in this country. Absolutely. You know, people who rely on fossil fuels to get to their jobs and right. to do their jobs. Right. It really is demonizing them. But again... It's the elites looking down on people who work for a living. Right. And it, and I put academics in that category. Right. Like, they don't spend enough time in the interior no. of their states. Like, I doubt They're in a bubble. most of them have, have been to They're farms. In a total bubble. Because if they talk to farmers, and I, I talked to a bunch of farmers in the Midwest in 2016 when Trump was running, and I was like, he actually might win. Right. Because they were like... No one listens to us. Right. Like the the and and you point this out the the corn incentives. Right. For growing corn, you know, which gets almost half of it gets turned into ethanol. Right. Which is super stupid. Yep. And it, it's this over involvement with the government, and they come up with policies that do not benefit people who, to your point, are the very best stewards of the environment. Well, I called out AOC for that on a panel in in Chicago last week and it just so happened that AOC's most recent chief of staff was in the room mm-hmm. and he came up to me afterwards cuz I said the world would be better off if AOC went to a community outside of New York or DC mm-hmm. because she has no idea what real people are dealing with and yet she's setting the policy for their lives and that's not fair so I said that on a panel and the chief of staff came up to me afterwards chewed me out and said she has visited rural communities she has been there and i'm like where and he had nothing yeah i mean he said he said well i'm from minnesota and and i lived in iowa i'm like no no where has she been yeah so she's been there she's been there with you You've told her about it you took her there (laughs) right to the places that you've heard about that you probably haven't even seen you've probably been in grand rapids or not grand rapids 20 years ago yeah and minneapolis right and so, so this guy, Iowa City. But by the end of him chewing me out, he agreed that they have zero representation of that yes. part of the world in their policy, and yet they're the ones who are controlling the narrative. So again, it goes back to the fact that those of us who have been skeptical of the environmental movement for a very long time mm-hmm. because of their anti-fossil fuel narrative, because of their anti-human narrative, this extinction narrative, that doesn't. Twenty fifty, we're dead. Right. That doesn't this. mean that we Thanks can't engage in our own way. No. And so there are a lot of conservatives who are environmentalists. Um, if you want to talk about and learn about this in a different way, this is your book, The Conservative. It's the only one out there now. <laughs> oh, you're dying again. I know. I'm dying for they this They were book. right. 2030. But, yeah. By 2030, you're going to die <laughs> <laughs> from climate change, and you're already it's starting to cough. I've been huffing fossil fuels. Uh, too much for too long. The conservative environmental is common sense solutions for a sustainable future by Benji Backer. Uh, get it now. Buy some for your friends. And what I love is the American Conservation Coalition is 40% independents and liberals. Yes. 
There's which I thought was a, a great statistic because there are people who want to engage with people who have something in common without shouting at each other. They the, just want to have a really smart dialogue in a different way. The environment used to be nonpartisan, and we used to come up with common sense solutions in the middle. Mm -hmm. We can do that again. Yes. And we do, we do need to leave the far left out of it. Amen. I, I, out I, of everything. I, out, of, out of all They've of it. They've wrecked everything. But there are a lot of liberals. They might be liberal on every other issue. They want a realistic solution on this. And that's why it's been so cool to see ACC's movement reach those people. Mm -hmm. Because there's a way to build a bridge to common sense liberals on a common sense approach on the environment. I love it. Benji, thank you so much. Congratulations thank on the so book. Thank you so much. Go buy the book now. This has been Kennedy Saves the World, along with Benji Backer. I'm Kennedy. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app. Oh, go ahead and leave me a review while you're there. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You've been listening to Kennedy Saves the World on the Fox News Podcast Network.